Well, we're going to be turning to John chapter 11 this morning. Um, Donna had a phone call early this morning from my dad saying that the Jack, who's the, the dog of the house, um, has probably had a stroke. I don't know how old he is now. 14, something like that. And like we said before, you get attached to animals and, you know, I love animals and pets and that. And when they're coming to the end of their life, it's sad, just like anything. You know, some people don't have children, have animals that they treat like children. And uh, I'm not into these people that are very blasé about it, saying it doesn't really matter. Because it does to a lot of people that have them. It's a massive part of their lives. And it is very sad and you start thinking things. And, you know, the previous dog we had, um, Eddie... He, he got poisoned, and they don't know if that was deliberate by um, somebody very, very, um, who lived close, who had sort of an argument, and they poisoned the dog with, with my dad, and that. there's some problems there, they reckon, but again, hard to prove. Um, and so you go through this, you know, this death of an animal, and it's tragic, and my dad, who is an atheist, and a very hard man, uh, he's cut up and busted up about it and it's very, very sad to see him that way. Uh, but that even through you know, these kind of things that these trials and tribulations come our way, he, he still won't turn to the Lord, it seems. So I just pray that even through this, somehow good will come. And even yesterday when we went for the drive and landed up at uh, my old school where I first went my primary school, you start thinking back of, of your life and all the things that go through your life. You know, I, I walked through the same halls and sat on the benches that I'd sat on when I was in, like, you know, seven, eight, nine. And um, it's, it's quite an emotional time. You go through, you see where you, you had your school dinners all that, and you park and you play your sports um, on the sports ground and that, and the playground, all these things. And uh, you start reminiscing, you're looking back, and uh, it can get you down. It can, you know, if you had a happy childhood, then obviously you can think, oh, that was a great time. Um, but a lot of people don't have happy childhoods either, so it's, it's a real mixed bag. But I was fortunate to have an enjoyable childhood, which I thank the Lord for. And, and then, you know, if, if they'd have told me at that age, obviously we wouldn't have understood, of course, but where I would be and what I'd be doing, I'd, I'd say, oh, I can't believe that, you know, that's, that's not like my plans for, the life, for my life. But um, it is quite incredible. Now that I'm 43, and those years that have passed, and you look back and you, you think all these things that you went through, you think about your family life, you know. Um, my mum and dad divorced and my sisters left and, you know, we've lost contact with everybody in the family and, oh, it's, it's, it's the whole thing shot to bits. But that is life, you know, and, and, and a lot of people have got it a lot worse than me. But we take comfort in the sense of that, you know, I'm a Christian now, I have a, a family and um, brothers and sisters all around the world uh, who trust in the Lord, who love the Lord, and that one day we're going to be together in heaven. And I have so much to look forward to, whereas, whereas an atheist um, has nothing to look forward to. And I'm just so grateful that the Lord has given us comfort, comfort of the Scriptures, and we're going to be turning there in Second John, John chapter 11, and that we can look at this, uh, this book and see what's ahead of us and see all these things that are going to happen, and you can take your eyes off the world, off the tragedy of, you know, whether your pet's dying or... The tragedy of you look back and you have regrets and you wish you had a closer family and all these things. And uh, you can get, and that's the trouble again with people that are atheists. They just keep looking back all the time. They have nothing to look forward to. As the Christian, you know, forgetting those things that are past. Forgetting those things that are behind. Yeah, and reaching forth, you press towards the mark. The high calling of God in Christ Jesus, yeah. And so that's what we do. We forget those things that are behind. So let's turn to the scriptures. Let's take encouragement this morning. Um, John chapter 11. Some interesting things in this passage. John chapter 11. We'll read the chapter. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus, of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Just to say, and before we go any further, is 
When you keep your eyes, it is so true, when you keep your eyes fixed on the Lord and you're talking to him, you're having fellowship with him and you're loving him and you're telling him about everything, you get through life miles, miles better. It's when you're backsliding or you take your eyes off the Lord and you try and deal with things yourself, that, that's the where the tough times come. So keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Again, we'll, we'll come back to some of these, but something that just you know, came to mind there is that um, you know, the first thing, when something goes wrong, they, they go seeking for the Lord. Shouldn't that be a lesson in our lives? Yeah? When something goes wrong in your life, the first person you need to turn to is the Lord Jesus Christ. A certain man was sick, Lazarus. Yet therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. One day we're going to be in a place where there is going to be no sickness and death. That's going to be wonderful. I'm looking forward to heaven. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. We'll come back to that. Then after that, Jesus, sorry, then after that, say, then after that saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee. And goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death. But they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent ye may believe, nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off, and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she, had, as soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where... Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come, where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her. He was groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man, which opened the eyes of the blind, have caused 
that even this man should not have died. Jesus therefore again groaned in himself, Come up to the grave. There was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto him, Loose him and let him go. And many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their ways, the ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take, her, take away both our place and nation. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this man, sorry, and this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied, that Jesus should die for the nation and not for that nation only but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad then from that, for, that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews but went thence unto a country near to the wilderness into a city called Ephraim and they continued with his disciples. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then sought they for Jesus, and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple, What think ye that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment, If any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might take him. I think that's a good chapter for the situation that we're in or find ourselves in over the last couple of days in regard to thinking about you know, serious things of life. You look back, you reminisce, you think of the people that have died, you think of people that are ill in your families, you know, even with the, your, your pets, all this kind of stuff. You know. But um, hopefully the Lord has led us to this chapter this morning and we'll get something out of it. But there's a lot in it and it's very, very interesting so let's just take it from the top and just break it down a little bit we see that certain man was sick named Lazarus um, of Bethany the town of Mary and her sister Martha and it was the same Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with the hair whose brother Lazarus was sick therefore his sister sent unto him saying Lord behold him whom he whom thou lovest is sick we all get sick and um, people in our families get sick it's part of the curse you know, the, the sin curse, one day that sin curse will be lifted and we won't get sick anymore. One day we shall be in heaven where there will be no sickness, no tears, no fear, no anxiety, no worry, and no death. And that will be wonderful. But until then, we're still going to go through this life and we're all going to get sick. And um, we're going to have to deal with that, deal with it in our own lives and deal with it in each other's lives as well. I love the, uh, the wording here in verse 3. He whom thou lovest is sick. I love that. And they're saying to Jesus, He whom thou lovest is sick. And so straight away they went to the Lord Jesus Christ, sought for his help. When Jesus heard that, he said, The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and his sister and Lazarus. When he had heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Now, Again, if you, um, Donna had to call this morning, you know, the dog was ill, dad called her, and so she goes straight away. 
Imagine if she'd have stayed two days and said, okay, I'll be there in two days. What does that show? Uncaring? Unloving? Not bothered? You know, what does that show? But that's not what it was like here with the Lord. He abode still in two days. You'd expect, all of us, I'm sure, if your family called you and says, you know, somebody's sick, you know, sick unto death, they're dying, you need to get here. You'd go. The word of God and the words of God is what matters in life. They came to Jesus when Lazarus was sick, dying. He whom thou lovest is sick, they said to the Lord. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. If you trusted what the Lord said, and you trusted the words, the words of God, then it didn't matter how long he would have stayed, you know that good will come out of this tragedy. It's trusting in God. It's trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God, that really matters, no matter what you go through. Bereavement, you know, death. What is worse than death? Obviously, you know, going to hell is the worst thing that could ever happen. But what is worse than death that you'll have to deal with in your life? So, I would say that the first thing we need to do, whatever, is to be, you know, draw so close to God, draw so close to God in everything that you do. Pour your heart and life out to him. Get to know him the best you can. Trust in him. Trust in his word, no matter what you go through. I would hate to lose my wife, my best friends, my family, anybody in my family. I'd hate to lose any of you. But whatever happens in life, no matter what we go through, whether we lose each other or not, we have to trust in God. He stays there, he abode there two days still, in the same place. <clears throat> this verse is a great illustration of God's delays in answering prayer. God allows delays for the following reasons. Number one, to give us more than what we asked. To give us more than what we asked. And you can write down there verses 21 to 26. 21 to 26 says, Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? You know what happened by him raising from the dead? a lot more than they had asked for. They learned so much more. So God delays answering our prayers because he wants to teach us something, show us something, help us to learn through this experience and we'll get more out of it. So sometimes you don't get your instant result that you want, that you think should be or should happen because God wants to teach you something that's deeper and more meaningful and more helpful in your life. Number two, God also delays in answering our prayers to manifest the power of God for his glory. Verse 39 and 40. Jesus Jesus said, Take ye away the stone, Martha. The sister of him that was dead saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God. God's going to do something amazing, and you're going to see the glory of God. And I keep saying this, and it just keeps being driven home to me, but the 
the good things in our lives, every single thing that happens that's any good in life, whether it's in your personal life, victory over sin, whether it's in your business life, your career, your, your sport, your family, whatever good you have, you receive, you go through, you experience, you should give the glory, all of the glory to God. Otherwise you're going to not see what you should be seeing. I hope you understand that. That's so important. Giving God the glory. So it's to manifest the power of God for his glory. Number three, strengthen. Why does God delay answering our prayers? To strengthen and deepen our faith in him. Verse 15 says, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. To strengthen and deepen our faith in him. So you're trusting in the Lord more. It's teaching us to trust in him. Deepen our faith. Strengthen our faith in him. And then the last one, why God, and I'm sure there's many more, but delays answering our prayers, is to teach us humility. Verse 32 to 35. When Mary was come, where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. To teach us humility. This morning I was looking um, at a couple of things before I came and checking a couple of things out on YouTube and uh, putting a couple of preachers in. And I keep saying this, but the more I look at preachers, the more I see arrogance, and the more I don't like preachers. I know it doesn't sound very good, but um, most of the teachers and preachers I look at or, or see today, in today's modern world, are arrogant, they're egotistical, they really rate themselves, they think they're something when they're nothing. And they just show hardly any humility. And I can't take to people like that. I struggle with them. And I don't. And I can understand why the world, looking at these kind of people, are not attracted to Christianity at all. Because they're so unlike Christ, it's unbelievable. Humility, it's something we should seek for in our lives. We don't hear about it much. We don't preach and teach about it. But we should be. We should be humble people. We are nothing without the Lord. And we shouldn't be arrogant, egotistical, opinionated people. We should be humble people walking um, in humility for the Lord. That's what we should be. Living the Christian life as we should be. So when he had heard therefore um, that he was sick, Lazarus was sick, he there abode two days. And for those reasons that we can understand that. Then after that um, saith he to his disciples, let us go unto Judea again. And so the disciples said to him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again. So straight away, you know, they, they're trying to stone the Lord Jesus Christ. They're jealous of him, who he is. You know, the Messiah has come. A lot of people believe it. A lot of people don't believe it. Some people think he's going to take over. Some think you know, he's going to set himself up as a king. And There's loads of things. They're jealous of him. They're seeing miracles happen. They hate the, the, the religious leaders of the day. hate him because he's getting all the praise and honour and the popularity. and that. So they just want to get rid of him. And so he's going to a place where um, they sought to stone him. They wanted to kill him and he's going back there. And again, there's a lesson in that, you know, for all of us. Um, that there are times in our lives where maybe, you know, it will be dangerous to go into situations. Maybe, we, we, you know, you feel like you shouldn't go back there, but maybe you should. And I'm not just, you know, take even the danger out of it. There are, there are places, we said that, you, you know, yesterday when we were going through this time together, this experience together of going back in life and looking at things and seeing how you grew up in the village where you were and you've got all these emotions. You can't go back. I go into the same school where I grew up and it's not the same. Things have changed. It's a different school, a different set of teachers, a a different curriculum in, in some ways. The whole thing is different. The way they teach today, what they teach today, everything is different. I'm going back into a place where, you know, you, you think, you know, I said before, you cannot trust your memory, you cannot trust your, yourself, your mind, and you think things are different, but when you, you know, and you think things are going to be like that, and when you go into that situation, it's different. 
I remember the school assembly was massive. You know, it's something like the NEC. When I go back there, I couldn't believe how small it was. It's because when you're a child, you look at things and things are so much bigger as you... Um, when you're a child that you see these things. When you used to play up the garden, you know, you play an army up the garden, you've got your gunny little um, tin hat on or your plastic hat, it was then, and your little army suit, and you run up the garden, you think you're running through, like, you know, a, a jungle. And yet, you know, you've got this little garden that you're playing through in the trees and that. You know, you, you, and you, where you think you picture things, oh, it's definitely there, and it's not. So you can't trust your memory and your, your mind at times. But why am I saying that? Because... That Jesus is going back to a place where he's in danger of. There are times in our lives where perhaps we're going to have to revisit things. You've tried to put it off, but you're going to have to go back to that place to deal with it. You can't, you know, they say you can't sweep things under the carpet. You've got to deal with things. And when we talked about that everyone has their mountains to climb and their Eurocliving, is it, their, their storms in their lives. And you can try and put things off. You, you know, some people can't get over bereavement. They can't deal with it. They don't know how to grieve. They don't want to grieve. And so they try and get over it somehow. You know, one of the first things people do is hit, even this morning, hit the whiskey bottle. You know, as if that's some, you know, you get some solace or some solution to that, you know. All you're doing is prolonging things. You've got to deal with things, face up. You've got to man up. We've all got to man up in our lives at times. So maybe there's things in your life that you've got to go back to, maybe, and deal with in order to move on. That's what really I'm trying to say here, I think. Maybe there's things that we try to get around, sweep under the carpet, you know, not deal with, not meet head on. But maybe there are certain things that you've got to go back and you've got to deal with in your own life or, you know, with somebody in your family even. I don't know. Maybe the Lord's speaking to you on, about a certain issue regarding this. His disciples said to him, Master of the Jews of late sought to stone thee and goest thou thither again. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. But if any man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Now we've said before, if you go to 1 Thessalonians 4, isn't it? 1 Thessalonians 4. For if we believe, verse 14, for if we, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. And then if you turn to John 11, John 11, where we are, that's where we are, sorry, verse 11 to 14, it's um, saying the sleep here, and it, it, it defines what it is, that's what I'm trying to say here. Um, wake him out of sleep. Then said his disciple, Lord, if, if he sleep, he shall do well. How be it, Jesus spake of his death. So he, when he's talking about sleep, he's saying that it's his death, he's died. But they thought that he had spoken of taking a rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. He's dead, he's died. Psalm 13, 3, Psalm 13, Um, 3 says consider and hear me O Lord my God lighten my eyes lest I sleep the sleep of death so sleep can mean rest but here it means death and also you have in 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians 11 1 Corinthians 11 talking about the Lord's Supper Um, verse 30 for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep Yep, so sleep here means death. <coughs> There's a lot of, again, you know, we're, all we're doing is, um, I said brushing over things, we're just looking at, picking out little things here that are relevant for, for us, but there's, there's so much more in this. This chapter, verse 16, I think is a very interesting verse. We haven't got time to, and I need to do some study on it. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us go that we may die with him. That's an interesting um, thing. We're going to die with him. And there's something in that. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days. So he'd been dead four days. By the time Jesus got to him, he'd been dead four days. Started decomposing, you know, the bodies and that. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. 
Um, I've got a reference here that that's about one and a half miles. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. And that's another thing, you know, when things go wrong in life, you need to comfort one another. You need to draw strength from other people and lean on other people. It's so good to have support. Isn't it the feeling of being helped, you know, that even with you going and, um, and, and Dad leaning on you, the feeling, just being there for someone is such a massive thing in life to the person that is struggling. There have been many times in my life when I have needed to lean on someone and you lot have been there and you've helped me and you've got me through it and, and it really helps, you know, even when I'm going through stuff that, even when you, perhaps you don't even know I'm going through and you can just lean on someone, you know, and you can just say something and just know that you've got comfort. I know that God willing that, you know, if anything goes wrong in my life or something happens that I can just call upon certain people in my life and you're there. That's wonderful. That's, that's just so, I just find that so comforting. I love that. We turn to the Lord first, of course, but having a, a somebody to go through that, to walk through that with each other is beautiful. Many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. We said yesterday, even when we were having something to eat and we saw somebody sitting on the bench by themselves, didn't we? Straight away they're thinking, now I wonder if they've got anybody to talk to. It is so sad that people go through life lonely, rejected, isolated. That's so sad. Maybe they are the, their own worst enemy. You know, Some people put themselves in this predicament, this situation, because they're so hard and nasty, they make out, you know, they don't care, and they're so opinionated, so arrogant, and they're vile people. And yet all they do is hurt themselves in the end because they've got nobody and they die alone. What a life, man. It's terrible. You know, you can feel sorry for them, but you can feel so angry as well because they won't wake up, they won't soften, they won't drop their guard. They're just going to pretend and but to be this person all the way through their lives. Horrific. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. And again, you see good and bad in this. You know, we, we, we know the account here because we've read it. Um, then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. So Mary's sitting, sitting there, and Martha is running out, yeah? And I see good in both, you know, good and bad in both. You could, you know, spend some time analysing this. But, okay, Mary, she, she's trusting in the Lord. She's trusting in the Lord, the Lord's coming, he's going to sort it out. Martha is perhaps, you know, a bit more on the wild side and she's thinking you know, she's perhaps not as at peace and she's panicking and she just wants to run I'm a Martha and I'm a Mary at times in my life and um, if it was me in that situation I'd have probably done the same as Martha run like crazy talk to Jesus say look if you'd have been here you know, I'd have shot off my mouth because I'm not thinking so I can see good and, and bad in this then Martha said and she Lord it's ours been here my brother had not died maybe that would have been the case yeah maybe he wouldn't have died the Lord would have touched him maybe the Lord allowed him to die and then resurrected him again who knows but it is good like I said before keep, go, keep taking everything back to Jesus Christ no matter what you go through but I know that even now whatsoever thou would ask of God God will give it thee Jesus said unto thy brother shall rise again I mean, if we take these words, these words that Jesus speaks, you know, thy brother, that's enough. You know, Abraham went to sacrifice his son Isaac. Why? Because he thought, you know, he was obedient to God, obviously, but he knew that the Lord would rise, raise him again from the dead. If Jesus says it, you know it's going to happen. You know, it's one, like I said before, the only thing you can trust in life is this, this book, the Word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ as well. Him first and, and the word. You can only trust those two things. So put your faith in God and keep your powder dry. <laughs> As Cromwell says. Jesus said unto him, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now, Again, oh, time just beats all the time. Um, they believed in the general resurrection, but if you turn to John 5, let's just walk through it again. John 5, this is so good stuff in here. John 5, 25 to 29. 
John 5. John 5, 25 to 29. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that sh- shall they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Since in the Old Testament the first and second advents are spoken of as being together, did you get that? In the Old Testament the first and second advents are spoken of as being together, Bible correctors have accepted verses 25 and 29 as the white throne judgment where the Christians would be saved by works. See, look at verse 29. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection and damnation. That's what you get for not rightly dividing this book. Bible corrected the AV connect verse 28 with the rapture of the church so that all the unsaved dead hear the shout of 1 Thessalonians 4.16 which of course is nonsense. There is no reference, listen, there is no reference to the rapture of any dead Christian in verses 25 to 29 which you have just read. What you are reading is the first resurrection of the Jews and tribulation saints in Revelation 20 verse 4 and 5 and the resurrection of the unsaved dead at the white throne judgment, Revelation 20 verse 12 to 13. The two resurrections turn out to be separated by a period of 1,000 years, Revelation 20 verse 6. The Christians aren't even there. But you can understand why, by, by not rightly defining it, you get a general resurrection and they reckon they're going to put all the Christians and the unsaved into one general judgment. That's not what happens. There's a difference between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. So Martha says, saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Verses 25 and 26 here are a reference to the rapture of the body of Christ. They give the exact order of the resurrection and rapture found in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 and 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52 to 54. Jesus is stating the fact that there can be a resurrection, listen carefully, from the dead before the dead come up at the last day. Verse 24, Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. All orthodox Jews believed in the resurrection, listen, of the dead, but none of them believed there could be a resurrection from the dead. A resurrection of the dead. Acts 23, Acts 23, verse 6. But when Paul perceived that, that the one part was Sadducees and the other part Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. So all Orthodox Jews believed in the resurrection of the dead, but none of them believed there could be a resurrection from the dead. Mark 9. Mark 9, verse 10. And they kept that saying within themselves, questioning one another, questioning one with another, what the rising from the dead should mean. And Acts 4, 12, of the dead and from the dead, just those little words are so important. Acts 4, 2 being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. 
though he were dead, yet shall he live. Spiritually speaking, yeah, I'm dead in my trespasses and sins. I'm sa- when I become a Christian, I get saved. I'm saved. So if the rapture happens, yeah, I don't die. I go straight into the presence of the Lord. I've been saved. I'm no longer dead. I have everlasting life. I'm no longer dead. I have everlasting life. And I'll not see death if the rapture happens in my lifetime, which God will in it will. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? So there's a resurrection of the dead when they actually die, and resurrection from the dead, which is dead in trespasses and sins. Does it make sense? But the Jews believed in the resurrection of the dead. But none of them believed there could be a resurrection from the dead. If you turn to Ephesians, there's Ephesians 2. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. We were. We were all dead before we were saved. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. They're waiting for him, and he is the one. He's the Messiah. He's the Christ, the anointed one that's come. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. Again, you could do a sermon on that. (laughs) That's a great term as well. When Jesus was not yet come into into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. Are you in the place where God meets you? Are you in the will of God? Do you understand where I'm coming from there? Are you in the place where God wants to meet you? Or are you outside of God's will? That would be a great verse to talk about the will of God in. The Jews then which were with her in the house and comforted her when they saw Mary that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. And when Mary was come, where Jesus was. There it is. You want to be in the centre of the will of God, where Jesus is. And saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. So he's the answer to everything. You can get through anything in life if you're with Jesus Christ. From the worst thing you could ever go through, you know, people tell us, well, I'm going through the most, I'm going through hell on earth, they say. People even recently told me that they're going through the most troubled times in their lives. If you're with Jesus Christ, listen, you'll come through it. But you've got to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Trusting in him, no matter what it is, you know, whether it's bereavement, whether it's um, a a broken marriage, uh, relationship, problems at work, stress, you're losing your job, you can't pay you, but whatever you're going through in life, whatever trouble you're going through, you've got to be close to the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll get you through it. And you can take comfort from this. You you read and you're saying, Lord, please just help me through this day by day. You know, some things you can't rush. I think we were saying about even the the Second World War yesterday, weren't we? Saying, you know, think two years into it, you think you've got another two years left. You know, when you're in it, they're they're thinking, when is this going to end? You know, and you're in a situation, you think, when is this going to end? But the closer you are to the Lord, the Lord will get you through. But the key is to trust in the Lord. And I think that's all we can do. So it is a message for today, for all of us, is to trust in the Lord. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. And they said the Jews, behold, how he loved him. You know, you talk about the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. He weeps. He understands. He understands what you're going through. Maybe you need to weep more, to cry more, to let God deal with you. Open up. The Lord understands. Thank God he came as a man that he understands what we go through, our pain, our hurting, 
our disappointment. You know, you talk about other religions and religious leaders. Nobody's like the Lord. You know, it's, it's even pointless to talk about Islam and Roman Catholicism and mediatrixes and all that kind of stuff. Listen, Jesus understands what we go through. Some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Yes, he could have. But there was reasons why he didn't. And there are reasons why we go through certain things. We can't see it. You know, <laughs> we can't see why we go through certain things. And if we had our way, we wouldn't choose to go through them. And even on earth, we'll never perhaps find out exactly why we did. Or why we had to. All we can do is again, just trust um, who is he that condemneth it is Christ that died yea rather is risen again who is even at the right hand of God who also maketh intercession for us who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall tribulation or distress persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written for thy sake we are killed all the day long we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Fantastic, isn't it? Nothing will separate you no matter what you go through. Verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are called according to his purpose. We can't see, we cannot see the good in certain things and why we've got to go through it. But we've got to go through it. The Lord understands, so we trust in him. Jesus therefore, again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. There was a cave and a stone laid upon it. Then he tells them to take away the stone. They complain, saying that he's been dead four days. He's going to stink now. Perhaps they're embarrassed. Perhaps, you know, all these things are going through their mind and they're saying, Lord, you know, it's too late now. You can't do it. And he said already, at least once, twice, you know, he will rise again. Trust in the Lord. Whatever he says comes to pass. He reiterates it again in verse 40. Is it Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God You see, take that glory of God. Seeing the glory of God. Giving God the glory. We said before, when you deal with people with old age, is there any glory in old age? For the man and for the woman, probably not. We're breaking up. You know, I'm feeling it. My body's busted up. And I'm feeling it. And I'm only 43. Yet the Lord tarried, 53, 63, 73, 83, 93, 103. Is there any glory in getting old and breaking down, forgetting things, your eyesight going, your hearing going? Remember we looked at that in Ecclesiastes. Your body, you know, just coming to the end. You can't do what you wanted to do or what you'd like to do. Is there any glory in that for us? No, but there's glory in it for God. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how hard you think you are, how powerful, how authoritative, how rich, how arrogant and egotistical you are, God gets the glory. The more I break down, the more that God gets the glory. Because I can't do anything to save myself. I can't do anything, you know... If I'm 43 or you know, if I'm 83, you know, I'm starting getting wrinkles, whatever. I can't, it doesn't matter if I put on half a ton of oil of Ulay makeup, <laughs> those wrinkles ain't going. God gets the glory. I am nothing. I'm going to be, land up a shriveled old prune, that's what I'm going to be, you know, in my old age if God tarries. God gets the glory. Like we said before, in every dispensation ends in failure, man's failure and apostasy. God gets the glory. Because we can't do it on our own. We can't run this world on our own. We can't run ourselves on our own. We can't keep ourselves alive. 
you know, we are dying. We are dying and we're going to die unless God saves us and takes us out of here. God gets the glory. The atheist on his deathbed, God gets the glory. He can die cursing God. God gets the glory. What is man that thou art mindful of him? We are nothing. God gets the glory. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said that they may by I said it that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Got down here the reference John 10, verse 3. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. What a great illustration that is. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. Jesus saith unto him, Loose him and let him go. Now again, you know, you could spend your life on John 11. Verse 44, you think about that. Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is dead. If I die, my body goes to the ground, to the grave. My soul goes to heaven, my spirit back to God. What happened to Lazarus in those four days? Isn't that interesting? They buried him. Was he in heaven? Did he have to leave heaven and come back? But he said, no, 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 listen, I'm happy here. I don't want, no, 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 listen, don't, no, no, don't call, don't. Oh. <laughs> Man alive. To be with the Lord, that's all that really matters in life. Lazarus is risen from the dead, the power of God. God made manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ is God. And he raises him from the dead. And he comes out and Jesus says, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen these things, which Jesus did, believed on him. They saw it. He comes with the signs, the wonders and the miracles. They, a lot of people saw it and believed in him because of those. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done oh man human beings there are some people in this life that are horrible there are some people in life that go through their lives getting a kick out of other people's misfortunes and tragedies tonight people are going to go to sleep and tomorrow they're going to wake up and they're these vile people are going to spend their day tomorrow scheming of how they can hurt other people. Some of them will strap bombs to themselves and walk into a marketplace. And they'll blow themselves up and take innocent life with them. Some of them will create computer programs and scams and send them out all over the internet just so they can get your personal information, that they can steal your money, they can destroy your computer, or they can falsify things. They're just spending their days doing that. Some people tomorrow are going out to hurt somebody else in some other way. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Human beings are vile. We have no hope without Jesus Christ. A lot of people saw what Jesus did and they believed in him, came to him, trusted in him. And then it says, but some of them, there's always some, there's always one. There's always one where you work with that you don't like. There's always somebody in the family that's the odd ball that seems to cause friction. Are you that person? If you are, I'm speaking to you. <laughs> Are you one of the some 
Some of them went their way to the Pharisees. Some of them just ran like little cowards. Run straight to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. You've got to see this man. They're scheming. Why? Because they want to kill him. They want to kill somebody that's risen somebody from the dead and brought life again. And brought happiness to the family that was bereaved. And these pathetic creatures of human beings have run because they want to drop Jesus in it. And they want to get him. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council. (laughs) And said, what do we? For this man doeth many miracles. We're not happy that he does them. We're not happy that people have life and are healed. We're not happy about that. You know, if I am... How mad is this, but if God touched my body or Donna's body, yeah, and cured us of arthritis, there would, some pe- there would be some people that wouldn't be happy with that. Did you get what I just said? There would be some people that are not happy with that. You don't believe me? You're nuts. Some people get a kick out of seeing other people in pain. Human beings. Unbelievable, isn't it? So they had a council. For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. They're going to take us away and our nation. And all these people are going to believe on Jesus. We need to, do, we need to stop him. What do you want us to do? Let's kill him. <laughs> what on earth is going through your mind and heart? And note the irony of history I've got down here. Listen to this. The Jews killed Jesus to keep the Romans from coming and taking away their place and their nation. But when they killed him, that is exactly what happened in AD 70. They ceased to be a nation until 1948, for they had adopted Caesar, a Roman, as their king. Look at John 19, verse 15. How pathetic these people were. And what did they bring about? Look at this. But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. It is beyond belief what man will do. These people ran to the Pharisees, they had a council and they said, we're going to have our nation take away, people are going to believe on him, we're going to lose our place, let's kill him. So they kill him. And exactly what they thought would happen, happened without the Lord. From that day on, when they took his life, they schemed against him, but when they took his life, until 1948, they never even were a nation. That's incredible. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all. And they certainly didn't. You don't know anything at all. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man, one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this he spake, And this spake he, not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that that nation. Notice that the Holy Spirit can prophesy accurately through an unsaved man who goes to hell when he dies. He speaks the truth, but he goes to hell when he dies. The outstanding case is the spirit-filled fundamentalist who spoke the literal words of God, and you'll look at Numbers 22.12, he wound up in outer darkness. 2 Peter 2.15, Jude 11, Revelation 2.14. So God can use an unsaved man to speak truth, to even prophesy. God can use the devil. If he can use the devil, he can use an unsaved man. 
And not for that nation only, thank God it wasn't just for Israel, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God. Interesting. Notice carefully again the doctrinal difference between a born again child of God called a son of God, John 1.12, and the Old Testament expression used for the nation of Israel as God's son, corporately children. Isaiah 1.2. Isaiah 43, 6. Isaiah 63, verse 8. We're a son of God. We're not just children. We're not just, you know, children. We are children of God. We're a son of God, we are. And not for that nation only, but also that he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Jew and Gentile we are. You know, we're brought into this one body. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. Interestingly, it Count Sel, S-E-L, and Count Sil, C-I-L, in verse 47. We need counsel one from another, S-E-L. Not to join a Count Sil. That's it always, 99.9% negative in scripture, isn't it? You have to check the references there. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went but went thence unto a country near to the wilderness into a city called Ephraim and they continued with his disciples and the Jews Passover was nigh at hand and many went out of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves and sought they for Jesus and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple what think ye that he will not come to the feast now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were he should show it that they might take a man is risen from the dead and all this happens because of that. Isn't that incredible? Human hearts. Oh, I love the Lord. <laughs> I so love the Lord. When you look at, I don't know how people cope without him. I look at my own life, you know, and I'm dealing with stuff in my life and fighting against the sin, the world, the flesh, the devil, and fighting against the things that are in the world and you know all the stuff that you do the problems and I just thank God that we can just keep talking to him and asking him for help and guidance and when I read John 11 and again all we've done is just skim the surface and you take all that comfort from it thinking listen nothing else matters in life just stay close to the Lord Jesus Christ love him, worship him, give him your all give him everything, serve him don't get wrapped up in the world and the careers and the sports and the fame and the fortune don't get wrapped up with any of that stuff live just, you know, as God blesses you just live according to your, your means and that and if you've got extra money help other people out and get the gospel out and reach the lost souls and, and study the Bible and just keep looking up because the Lord's coming back soon that's life, man that's life live for him in everything you do and don't you know you can spend your house you spend your life and just filling your house with all these things all these ornaments and treasures and spend out your money what is that all about listen live for Jesus Christ in everything thought, word and deed be totally sold out to him then you'll understand about being content in life not having to want for anything, just trust it in the Lord. And then when things happen in your life that um, you have to deal with, it will be a lot easier for you to go through those situations because you'll be closer to the Lord Jesus. That we can cope, that we don't get so et, et up with things, you know. And even, you know, it's, uh, the illustration of this morning is not getting attached to things that don't really matter in life. You know, being addicted to the Lord and addicted to nothing else in life and addicted to serving the Lord and doing the ministry of the Lord loving him so your whole life is from the moment you get up in the morning to the moment you lay down at, at, on your pillow at night is you're constantly focused and you're thinking about Jesus Christ that's what life's about so hopefully we've taken some comfort from the scriptures in what we have read even this morning, we can apply it to our lives to help us to deal with things, situations that we go through. Even that, that, you know, that lady has recently phoned us, she's going through some horrendous health problems, but she knows that she's got to just stay close to the Lord no matter what she goes through. May we all just trust in him a little bit more day by day until we see him, which is going to be very, very soon. Let us pray.